come. Hello, plastic. It's massive. Before we talk about plastic, uh, I need to talk about sauces, okay? Not delicious sauces that you put on chips. Sources in science means where do you get your information from? So, a little, a little exercise for you to get your brains thinking. Let's say you've heard a rumour that cake is really good for you. You want to find out if this rumour is true. Um, who would you go to to ask? Do you ask your neighbours who are in a cake stall? Or do you ask your doctor? Have you done that? You come up with some ideas? All right, brilliant, yes. People are telling me the doctor. Good, yes, because these people know about cake, but they want you to buy the cake, so we say they're biased. They'll just say anything to get you to buy cake. Yeah, it's really good for you. Yeah, it's got loads of protein in it. Your doctor has studied for a long time and just wants you to be healthy, so your doctor would tell you the truth. Um, if you wanted to know whether robot doctors was a good idea, who would you ask? Hmm. Would you ask the doctor? Or is the doctor going to think, oh, robot doctors would mean that I lose my job. So maybe that, in that case, they wouldn't give you a straightforward, honest answer. Uh, in that case, cake people are probably no good either. You've got to go to the internet. That's what I had to do to research plastics. I had to look on the internet. And you've got to be so careful of your sources. If you type in to the internet, how is plastic made? I bet that's a really common question, isn't it? The first hit that comes up. In fact, you know, it gives you a description without you even having to click on the website. It's that, that bit that comes up says, plastics are made from natural materials such as cellulose, that's plants, coal, natural gas, salt and crude oil. So I thought, well, that's interesting. I can't find anything online about plastic being made from salt, but they've said it there, so that's maybe true. And when you click in, it says that plastics are made from natural organic materials. Now. If you think of the word organic, you might picture like lush green fields with cows roaming free. In science, organic just means has carbon particles in it. That's all it means. Um, so they're right, but it seems like a strange word to use. Also on their website is this amazing, like really colourful booklet designed for kids. Uh, it tells you that before we had plastic, um, toothbrushes were just made out of like the bristles from pigs' bums. and wood so you've got a lot of splinters so if we didn't have plastic we wouldn't be able to um we'd all be using like pig's bums to clean our teeth and i thought well that's weird because i've got a bamboo toothbrush and it works really nicely and then you get to the bottom i'm going to post you a link to this story um because if if you're old enough to understand why this is funny you have to read it it's very funny there's a story called the plastic princess i'll, I'll be very fast it's about a king who asks his three daughters how much they love him. And the first daughter says, I love you as much as gold. And he thinks, oh, brilliant, gold's really good. The second princess says, I love you as much as salt. And he says, great, yeah, salt's very valuable. And the third princess says, I love you as much as plastic. And the king is furious and banishes her from the kingdom. And anyway, um, she meets a fairy in the woods, does the princess, who says, yes, a lot of people haven't realised how amazing plastic is. Your father sounds like he needs my help. And, um... And the, the magic fairy takes all the plastic away from the king. So when he wakes up in the morning, the, the place on his desk where his servant usually put the bottle of mineral water was now covered by a large pool of water. He stopped short, realising that lately they'd been using plastic bottles instead of heavier bottles made of glass. And that's when I thought, wait, what? Come on. I think most people know that plastic bottles aren't good. Like, glass isn't that heavy. You're a king. Like, pres presumably perfectly capable of lifting. Anyway, the point that I'm getting at is... Uh, this website is called Plastics Europe. What do you think that Plastics Europe might sell? What might they be trying to sell you? Yeah, they sell plastics. They make loads of money out of selling plastics. So, so that was quite a long way of saying that when you look stuff up on the internet, just be really, really careful um, who is giving you the information. Plastic is, you can sort of imagine it like a string of beads. It lots of teeny tiny little particles called monomers that all get strung together to make things called polymers. Now all plastics are polymers but not all polymers are plastic. Same way like not all dogs are Alsatian dogs. You get all different kinds of dogs. You get all different kinds of polymers. Let's look at how plastics are made. My, my children help me with this picture uh, which is why it's so brilliant. If you've got my cookbook, if you support me on Patreon, many many thanks, you'll know this already. Um, millions and millions of years ago the earth was covered in very shallow seas, you see? Um, and these seas had algae and plants in, and when they died, they fell to the bottom of these shallow seas. 
what the laughing face is about guys we spent ages on this um, and got slowly buried by layers and layers and layers of silt now these layers went deeper and deeper and deeper under the ground as time went by millions of years went by soil piled up on top so this layer of plankton and, um, and plants moved down and down under the ground under an awful lot of pressure from the rocks above and what else do we know about near the center of the earth if you uh, watched volcanoes and earthquakes lesson it's very very hot so they got very hot they got put under a lot of pressure and eventually these ancient uh, bits of plant turn into something called hydrocarbons which are just particles that have hydrogen and carbon in them and then humans realized that if they burned these hydrocarbons they gave off a lot of energy so we started drilling down 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 deep into the ground and pulling all these hydrocarbons out of the ground crude oil which is what those hydrocarbons are when they come out of the ground uh, it's just really thick gloopy oil is made of loads and loads of different monomers but if you heat it up to a very very high temperature it cracks into like five or six different monomers little particles that you can put together to make plastics so the simplest monomer you can get is ethene let's pretend that chocolate is ethene and do a little activity come down here with me i've got some grated chocolate here in a bowl i've got four tablespoons i'm going to put some hot hot water into this mug as hot as possible really. There we go. So I've got we've got our four tablespoons heating up, three tablespoons into your mug. So they're getting nice and hot. Yeah, adults did you see me saying that uh, you could, if you're here, uh, light a candle and we'll melt a bit of chocolate over the candle and see what happens. Oh, do you know what I've done? What an idiot. Um, I've forgotten my butter. Absolutely essential. Is it essential? Yeah, it is essential. I'm going to go and get my butter. You get set up, light a candle if you've got one, put your boiling water in your mug, put your teaspoons in there, put your chocolate up small. <laughs> I'll be back in the longest 30 seconds of my life. <sighs> Hiya. Child one is shouting, Mummy, watch this. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 a bit later. Right. Here's what we're going to do. Chocolate is one monomer called ethene, but um, we've got a couple more monomers, haven't we? We've got butter, and we've got some water as well. You can just use water in the mug. Get a tablespoon then, give it a good dry. Really, really good dry, that's important. Can't be any water on it. And actually, do all four at the same time. Dry off all four of your tablespoons and put a little bit of chocolate on each one, like about a teaspoon. So basically we have become chocolate designers and this is a model, again if you saw Volcanoes lesson you know what I'm talking about, this is a model for how people design plastics and I'll tell you why I think it's a brilliant model when we've done it. So put a little teaspoon of chocolate onto each one of your tablespoons, I'm probably using a bit much actually because I love chocolate but we want it to melt so we don't use too much. <sighs> there we go and if you washed your hands, which I hope you did, uh, you can give it a little pat down as well. You get it really nice and melty. Here we are, we're just giving it all a good stab. What we're going to do is leave one as it is, because that is our control. In science, control means the thing that you don't do anything to, so we can remember like how chocolate behaves when it's just normal chocolate. And then we're going to put a little bit of butter into one and give it a stir. And we're going to put a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of water in. Give it a stir, don't put too much in or you'll ruin it. Right. Mm. Do you add oil to the butter? Stephanie, if you haven't if you haven't got any chocolate, um, put butter on each tablespoon and then add oil to one. But you don't need oil if you've got chocolate. Right, let's put a tiny little bit, like less than half of the amount of chocolate you've got on of butter or marge onto one of your tablespoons and give that a little stir stir if you have got a candle you could heat it up a little bit but don't do that too much it should be all right just with the heat from the tablespoon as long as you're not using too much right if you've done your butter then like i say the teeniest tiniest amount of water just like literally a drop stick that in give it a stir and see what happens it might surprise you this one 
and if it's not all turned to water you could you could add a little drop more but actually no a drop's probably enough yeah there we go look what's happened is it's gone a bit a bit solid did you expect that i'm going to put a, the tiniest amount more in there we go one of them is going to be our control and the other one which yeah parents can do if you're around is uh, i'm just going to heat the chocolate up to see what happens there um basically yeah what you've become here is a chocolate designer so have a look at each one of your chocolates um you could probably touch them as long as you haven't used a fire because they won't be that hot just have a look at what we call the um the properties now of the chocolate how is the chocolate behaving adding different things to the chocolate has changed its property so the one with the butter and the chocolate is still quite quite wet for me uh, the one with the water and the chocolate has gone really hard and the normal chocolate is just starting to solidify it's heating this one up so if someone came to you and said right i'm building uh making a, a cake and i need some modeling chocolate you might say oh yeah okay and go off to your kitchen mix some water in with some chocolate and post that off to them and they would be a very happy customer. Uh, maybe a really fancy cake decorator would come to you and say, I need some waterproof chocolate for a celebrity's birthday cake. And you'd have to run around your house experimenting, adding lots of different things to your chocolate to see if you could change its property and make it waterproof. This is essentially what people who make plastics do. We've got to the stage with humanity where we can make plastic that does anything really. We can make plastic that works in bulletproof vests, um, we can make like rubber gloves, uh, we, can, we can do anything, can't we? We can put plastic into nappies so that it becomes really absorbent. There we go, so that's the very heated one. Can you see, I wouldn't touch that one because it'll be very hot if you put the spoon over the fire, but it's become very, very crumbly and it doesn't smell very nice. And the other reason it's a very good model is um, you didn't actually have to mix anything to change the property of the chocolate, did you? So heating up the chocolate made it look very different and behave very differently to the control normal chocolate. And it's the same with plastic. Ethene, if you react that with itself by heating it up a lot, you get polyethene, polythene, which we will talk about later, but it's the stuff that cling film is made of. So it's a good model because you don't have to um, react the chocolate with anything. You can heat it up and change its properties. Also, um, it gives quite unexpected results, doesn't it? So did you notice that when you added water, which is a liquid to the chocolate, you got something which is really quite, quite solid. Um, and it's the same with plastic. So a woman that nearly made story time this week, but not quite, um, a chemist called Stephanie, I can't remember her second name. She um, was, at work and her chemistry lab had been told you need to develop a new really strong type of plastic uh, which is very light and how you make plastic is you come up with a liquid and you take the liquid to a spinner a person who works a spinning machine and they pour it into the machine and it makes threads for you now stephanie came up with a liquid that was really runny much runnier than anything that had ever been spun before and it looked like it had little bits in and when she took it to the spinner he said, I'm not spinning that, you've not done it right. And she said, yeah, I have. The stuff that came out was five times stronger than steel. Stephanie had discovered, invented something called Kevlar. And if you ever see firefighters, policemen, army journalists in war zones wearing like protective sort of padded hats and padded jackets, uh, that is made from Kevlar. It has saved millions of lives probably across the world because it's incredibly strong but it's got a little bit of give so if a flying bit of metal comes towards you it sort of acts a little bit like a trampoline and absorbs the energy so you don't get hurt and the other less cool reason that this is a good model is um come back to your solid chocolate again maybe you could have had a bit of fun modeling this chocolate like rolling it into a little ball making it into a little i don't know a little poo model but if you leave that alone for a while and then you come back to it, you'll find that it falls apart. It's, it's very, very brittle. And it's the same with plastic. We have made plastics that we thought were fantastic. And then sometimes a lot of years later, we've realised that they actually also behave in a way that is really not good at all. Um, my challenge to you was to find something that said it was BPA free. You find that quite a lot on babies' bottles. There we go, something that I brought back from the 
hospital with me. You see it says buy fennel free. Now again this is a rumour I'd heard and I had to check a lot of different sources but BPA is a chemical that they added to plastic to make it really strong so it gets used in um, food products a lot it lines the cans of uh, food and drinks cans as well um, but yeah it was it was years and years and years later that they discovered that this chemical BPA that they put into the plastic was actually um, leaching out of the plastic and into food and BPA has been found in the urine of 90% I think over 90% of Americans. It's been found in breast milk. Uh, it's all over the place. Like we're, we're consuming it a lot. And what I found out is that it's, it's been scientifically proven that BPA is incredibly dangerous in high amounts. What we haven't proved, what we don't know, is whether it's safe in very small amounts. And there's a debate going on about this. So in France, they've banned BPA from everything. But in the UK, we said that our government said that the science didn't suggest that we needed to do that, so we haven't banned BPA. Um, now, the sort of even worse bit is that some of the stuff they're replacing BPA with, studies are starting to show that that might be even worse than BPA. So I kept waiting to find the article that said, oh, now BPA is illegal. Uh, and it's not because the, the science just isn't there yet. But there you go. We're going to talk a lot about how plastics have had consequences that we weren't expecting. Okay, get all your plastics together then. Let's have a look at real plastics in the real world. So, have you got number one? Number one plastic, if you've just joined, didn't see the invite, what we're looking at is different plastics have different numbers from one to seven on their bottom. Some of them are very common. Number one, it's just sort of, it sort of slightly annoyed me. They've, they've put in really big, bit at the front here I am 100% recyclable um yeah it all all plastic bottles that you use for drinks that are, that are peed are recyclable that's not like a special thing that you've done coca-cola if you'd said 100% recycled that would be very cool wouldn't it number two polyethene now if you imagine monomers being like building blocks like lego then you can arrange lego in all different ways and it's exactly the same with plastic. So we're looking at two types of polythene today. This one is number two. It's not very good at being clear. Very, very strong and sturdy. So if you look at your number two, you might see that it says HDPE. That is high density polyethene. The particles are very close together. Very tough. Number three was a weird one, wasn't it? The only number three that I could find was on this bottle of children's vitamins. This is PVC. So the other thing that they make PVC out of is, uh, is plastic tubing. Your, your gutters are probably made of PVC because again it doesn't react very much so it's, it's very tough and sturdy. It turns out it has got chemicals in it which over time uh, do come out and also these dangerous chemicals make it really really difficult to recycle. So why are my children's vitamins made out of? You can see why people start getting really freaked out about plastic and there's a lot of rumours flying around. Number four caused some issues, didn't it? I finally found one hiding in my reusable coffee cup. Low density polyethene. The high density one is really easy to recycle. Uh, number fours are not very easy to recycle. So if you couldn't find any of these, then well done. That's actually really good because you, you, you don't have to worry getting rid of them, do you? Number fives. It's tough. It's light. It's heat resistant. It doesn't let any grease or moisture in so you might if you've got any plastic jugs at home you might find that a lot of that's made of uh, number five or stuff that you reuse like little plastic children's bowls oh, number six is the worst polystyrene is 98 percent air um, but it's so annoying to recycle because it takes up loads of space but it's really light so if you put this on a lorry and you take it all the way to the recycling plant and you melt it down like you've hardly got anything there so it's not really worth recycling it just avoid polystyrene. We bought a fridge this week, which is what all this horrible stuff is. I don't know what I'm going to do with this. And finally, number seven was a bit of an anticlimax, really, because it just means other. Here's what I found that was a number seven. Um, yeah, it just means other, so you could have any letters under there. So it's generally very difficult to recycle. Even more confusingly, the new plastics that you get are compostable, they're also number sevens. So you can't recycle those at all but you can throw it in your compost. Now, 
we're going to have to get to why plastic is a problem. The thing that Plastics Europe didn't mention to us, uh, it takes a really long time to break down. So if you'd eaten half an apple and you'd left it in your car at the start of lockdown and three months later you finally went for a little journey and you came back to the car, would you want to eat that apple? No, you wouldn't because bacteria would have got to it, started breaking it down, making it all nice and mouldy and if you throw that apple outside eventually it's just going to degrade away into the soil. Plastic doesn't do that very well and this is where I get to show you um, the resource that I got from Practical Action, the charity, which I will put a link to in the description of this video when I finish. They've just done this beautiful resource. It's not often I say this. Um, there's loads and loads of activities that you can do about plastic. Loads of really fun, like how to make bunting out of plastic bags and all that kind of thing. But it goes to quite a high level as well. I've definitely looked them up. They're not they're not paying me or anything, though, charity. Um, but yeah, I was really impressed. They, those are the resources that I would make if I had, you know, any time and any prior knowledge of plastics. So this is something that they did that I'd like you to do. Have a look at all these things and can you rank them one to eight with uh, how fast you think they break down? So you've got a mobile phone, a woolen sock, a tea bag, a plastic bottle, a biological plastic carry bag, apple core, magazine and a banana skin. Which one do you think, if you buried them all on the ground, which one would break down first? and which one will break down last. And if you think that's easy, then you can try and say how long you think they would each take as well. So I'm just gonna go and drink coffee and I'll, yeah, I'll, see, you in, I'll see you in 30 seconds. Have you done that? Should we have a look at the answers? So the tea bag was first, that only takes a month, banana skin, six weeks, apple core, two months, so there you go, you would have not met a nice sight in your car, woolen socks take a year, and then a plastic bag takes 20 years, a magazine takes 50 years, a plastic bottle takes 450 years, and yes, well done if you said mobile phone, mobile phone takes a thousand years plus, yeah, I'm seeing angry faces and for once I'm thinking, yeah. You're right, I'm angry too. Isn't that horrendous? So yeah, that was um, practical action. I would definitely look them up. But why is it why, why is it bad that stuff just sticks around? You know, is that, is that such a bad thing? 450 years for a bottle lying around? Well, yes, it, it, is. It, it, it is. So much of this is just like scientifically, objectively, really bad. Because where do we put it? Like when we've made more plastic in the last 15 years, than the whole of mankind has made before. So there's loads of it and loads of it is single use. So you just open a packet of crisps, you eat them and then you just get rid of it, don't you? Um, loads of it isn't being recycled. A lot of it goes to landfill. Now the problem with landfill is, like I said before, plastic has got chemicals in it which tend to leach out. So landfill, big mound of rubbish, rain falls onto the landfill and all those chemicals um, go into the water. So the water becomes this, this sort of poisonous stew, which we call leachate, which leaks out of the landfill and heads towards rivers and streams and is incredibly damaging to wildlife. Now I looked up how this is being handled and apparently um, what we've done is we've, we've now made it legal that you have to line landfills with like three layers of specially designed lining. If, if there was like a landfill site above your house and I said, oh, sorry, I put three really cool technical layers like below it to keep it all in so it doesn't squash your house. You probably wouldn't feel great, would you? So I don't, don't know, it doesn't sound like a very long term solution to me. The other problem, which if you go to school, you've probably heard of by now, is the plastic gets into the oceans. And this is a problem for quite a few reasons. Um, very simply, animals think it's food go towards it and get tangled up in it. Um, but animals also eat it and then it fills up their stomachs. So they think they're full and then they starve. Um, and also the wind and the waves and the sun break the plastic down until it's maybe less than five millimeters across. And that is what we call microplastic. Now microplastic has been found everywhere on earth. We found it on Mount Everest. We found it at the bottoms of the, the deepest trenches in the sea. It's everywhere. And I'm always saying to you, oh, we don't know about this, so you should go away and study this. 
we have no idea really yet what problems microplastics are causing. Um, there's all kinds of new studies being done. That's a good news, there's a lot of money being put into finding out what the problem is. But I'm sure in 10, 15 years time when you go to university, uh, there'll be a lot of work for you to do if you want to do that work. Um, so plastic in the oceans, you just, you can't really get it out. It forms these absolutely enormous garbage piles, like multiple times the size of France in the ocean. And part of the problem is psychology, isn't it? Like, if you said to me, oh, Lara, if you put that plastic bag in the dustbin, I'm going to kill this bird. I definitely wouldn't do it. Of course I wouldn't do it. But if I'm in a hurry and I feel I'm really busy and I haven't got time to go to the supermarket, maybe I'll put my plastic bag in the bin because I can't really picture this enormous mound of rubbish miles and miles and miles away from me that is going to be killing these animals. But it's 700... 700 different species that we know of um, are affected by plastics in the oceans. Yes, thank you, Yolanda. Yeah, Yolanda's saying uh, microplastics in drinking water, they're everywhere. Um, they're, in, they're in salt. We found them in, in all our salt. Yeah, I mean, we definitely, we eat them on a regular basis. James said, I can't believe it would take a thousand years to break down. We love going litter picking and are shocked at the amount of plastics found. Yeah, the amount of plastics in the ocean is the equivalent to five sacks of plastic been left out on every foot of coastline in the world. So if you imagine all the beaches in the world, if you put five sacks of rubbish on every single foot of them, like about that, that would be how much plastic in the ocean. And now we're going to do, we're going to do story time. This is not really a story time about plastics, it's a story time about polymers. But you know, who wants to hear about it? person working with plastics. This was such a good story that I just had to tell you it. So off we go. Let's, let's go and cheer ourselves up a bit. And then I'm afraid we're going to look at how we solve the plastic problem and how difficult that is. <sighs> Here we are. Now, doesn't this look nicer already? Paula Hammond was raised in Detroit when she was very young. She moved to a pretty much all white area. They were the only African American family on the street. And as a child, she remembers just loving nature. She says, um, uh, her exact words were, I had a thing with ants. She just used to sit in her backyard and watch the ants carrying food around and building mounds. Uh, she remembers a beautiful cherry tree in her garden. And again, her own words, she said she loved to pick things off the ground and then pull them apart and inspect them just to see how they work. I don't, I don't know about the pulling apart thing, but you know, scientists be scientists. So there you are. Um, her favourite place was the library. There were lots of lovely posters on the walls and there were books everywhere and there were little corners where you could go to read your books. Now her parents were both scientists. Her mother had a master's degree in nursing and her dad was a biochemist and Paula says her parents were very very focused on letting their kids know that they could be anything and their message to their kids were to work hard be the best that you could be and be creative. So Paula says she felt like when she got to school, she could really go in any direction. She just wanted to be creative and learn. But then she discovered chemistry lessons. She had a very good chemistry teacher, very inspiring. And she said she just fell in love with the chemistry lessons watching things change colour, like watching uh, heat come off different chemicals, watching two things mix to become a third thing. She said it was, it was just absolutely brilliant. It was a really good school, she says, because she could be creative without having any inhibitions at all. And her teacher convinced her to do chemical engineering when she left school. So she did. Now she looked at a lot of different universities, but when she got to... The Massachusetts Institute of Technology, see, she said she just felt just instantly at home. This might ring a bell with some of you. She said students, whatever age, were just walking along, openly talking like nerds. She said it was so refreshing. She loved that. Nobody was perfectly dressed and nobody cared. And if you were a little bit quirky, then that was a great thing. She said it was very comforting. Um, she used to like to joke that in Detroit, she'd only really met a couple of flavours of people, whereas here at university, she was meeting every different flavour of person all at the same time. She said it was like meeting the whole world at once and there was a subway and she, she could go anywhere she wanted. And it was all incredibly exciting. Um, after university, she went to work at Motorola, the mobile phone company. 
And here, if you watch interviews with her, um, she, she puts on a very patient tone of voice. She says, it was an interesting time, the 80s. People weren't used to interacting with African Americans, Americans as engineers. There were uncomfortable jokes and strangenesses which would occur about race, which I wasn't used to experiencing at MIT. Um, I would walk through the factory line as the only black woman not working in the factory. And when someone would ask me about the line, I would say, oh, um, actually, I'm an engineer. And she said it, it was a chance to educate. And she thought of it that way, which sounds very tactful to me. She went back to MIT, actually became a single mother in the middle of her PhD. Um, but she said that MIT were incredibly supportive uh, and offered a lot of babysitters. And she said the true engineer in me wanted to use science to solve problems. So here is a problem to do with treating cancer. Now, cancer drugs are poisonous. They're usually poisonous. Which is good because they kill cancer cells, but it's bad because um, if the body detects them, then the, your immune system kicks in and your body destroys the, the drugs that's supposed to be killing the cancer. So that's no good. So how do we get cancer drugs into the body to kill cancer without your body destroying the drugs? Well, here comes the really exciting bit of Paula's work. Um, she designed these polymers that deliver drugs. They look like little soap bubbles, but they are really, 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 really small. On the inside of this bubble are the cancer drugs, but on the outside they put polymers which cloak the nanoparticle and actually make it look like water. They're called stealth polymers because they go into the bloodstream, bloodstream full of white blood cells, looking for germs that they can destroy. But these stealth particles, they carry the drugs through your bloodstream and they're not detected by the white blood cells. And don't forget, these are like less than a thousandth the size of your hair. Um, and the cancerous tumour has got leaks in its blood vessels and what the nanoparticle does is it gets to the cancerous tumour, it gets all tangled up and then it bursts open and, uh, and all the cancer drugs come out. And that's how you treat cancer with nanotechnology. Um, and yet if you look at Paula Hammond then she's, she's still doing that, she's working on all kinds of things. Um, there's a, a drug which slowly releases drops into your eyes so that people don't get illnesses that make them go blind. Uh, there's a spray for soldiers that makes their blood clot almost instantly so they don't get infected. So there you go, a little bit of positivity for you. Polymers, definitely not all bad. Some of them are totally awesome. Uh, but back, back to the uh, type of polymer that is a plastic. So what are we going to do about this? Okay, did you have a think about uh, reduce, reuse, recycle and which one is the best one? Oh, the research that I did into recycling. So what happens when your stuff leaves the house uh, in your recycling box? Okay, it gets taken to a sorting plant in Britain where people sort through all the different plastics and glass and tin or whatever, um, put them on different conveyor belts. What happens after that? Well, some of it stays in the UK and gets turned into plastic pellets, which gets turned into more plastic materials. But two thirds of it used to get sent to Europe and Asia um, until China basically said that they weren't going to accept any more of the world's old plastic. And then everyone sort of panicked and started shipping it to anyone who would take it, places like uh, Thailand and then a lot of documentaries came out, a lot of exposés, very brave, um, excellent journalists showing that actually a lot of plastic recycling ends up just getting burned in another country. Like rather than dealing with it, we're just shipping it elsewhere and making it somebody else's problem. Now the things are, um, I don't want to tell you that plastic recycling is bad, but it's certainly not perfect. They've invented a plastic now specifically in order for it to be recycled. So we were talking about how monomers are a bit like Lego bricks. It's a plastic where if you dip it into a strong acid, it just breaks apart again into its monomers and then you can just build it up again. So that's good. So the science is coming on. It's just a bit slow. Let's talk about reusing 
What did you think about my reuse of a Kinder Surprise? Do you think that that is a good way of reusing a Kinder Surprise? Hmm? Is that helping the environment? Maybe? Reduce, reuse, recycle? So recycle, yeah, it's got some problems. Um, another problem with recycling plastic is if you recycle a, a can, an aluminium can, say it took like 100 units of energy to make the can, if you recycle it, then you make it, it's kind of as if the can only took five units of energy to make, like you've saved a lot of energy by recycling the can. Plastic isn't like that at all, like you've got to move it around a lot with vehicles which give off polluting gases, then you've got to sort it and then you've got to pack it up and move it again and then you've got to heat it up and melt it down. It takes a lot of energy to recycle plastic, like almost, yeah, an, an awful lot. Um, guys, are you saying that that's a good reuse for a Kinder Surprise? Because th this is an issue that I've got. Um, I went to see a play which was about how animals are getting damaged by plastic in the ocean. Before the play there was a workshop uh, which said that you got to build something out of um, like recycled materials. I thought, oh brilliant, and I got there and it was just sticking googly eyes to lots of things and then like painting them with, with glitter pens. And I thought, you know, no offence to my kid's model, but I'm still going to end up putting this in the bin. But now it's got googly eyes on it. Like, can you recycle googly eyes? I don't know. What have I done here? I've, I've just wrapped this in sellotape. I'm not going to keep this, am I? I've just used more plasticky stuff to, to reuse a thing for like five minutes. A lot of the time um, when we say reuse, we actually mean reusing something that isn't plastic like a milk bottle that you put milk in you can use that for your milk but then you can give it back and uh, someone can put more milk in it that's what reusing is about so there's actually a very new company coming to the uk soon which do something where they'll put big brands like coca-cola or whatever or toothpaste into reusable bottles and you get it delivered to your house and you use it and you send the bottles back the only problem is it's quite expensive so by far the best way really is to reduce our plastic consumption and uh, that kind of falls to us can you use a bamboo toothbrush instead of a plastic toothbrush can you use a glass bottle i want to show you this these clouds that i use in all my lessons these are actually made of recycled plastic bottles it's carpet underlay which is made entirely from recycled plastic bottles so um so that's that's quite good isn't it recycling it isn't it isn't all bad plastics are used in a lot of a lot of medical equipment and for a lot of protective clothing so not all plastics are bad i have a few quotes here that i found from experts in their fields saying that the problem is not really plastic the problem is our throwaway culture we've just got totally carried away with this idea that we can use plastic and then just chuck it um, plastics have revolutionized medicine someone said with life-saving devices made space travel possible they've lightened cars so because cars and um, airplanes are a lot lighter they use less fuel so in some ways uh, plastics are good for the environment because they're putting less dangerous gases in they often uh, they're allowing for less climate change but it's these reusable plastics which we can't take some control of uh, that we've got to think more carefully about Okay, I think I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> um, thank you so much for joining me. It was a real stressful lesson to plan this because I didn't want to tell you just, oh, plastics are bad and not explain anything about plastics. But I certainly don't want you to get really confused and go away thinking that plastics are great. Uh, as I always say, if you enjoyed that, please like my Facebook page. Please subscribe to me on YouTube. Um, if you'd like to support me monetarily and sign up to my Patreon page, um, I said that I was going to send out an e um, uh, a newsletter to anyone who supported me with £5 pounds already, but it's turned into a fully blown magazine with loads of different articles and features, so that is coming quite soon. But everyone who signs up on my Patreon page gets my cookbook and any activity sheet that I might have made for previous lessons as well. Um, I just found out you can monetize Facebook videos if you have 10,000 followers, and I'm about 300 off. So if you've only liked me on Facebook, and you want to give me a follow as well, that would be totally awesome. Thank you so much. Right. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you're not too depressed now. See you soon. Bye.